Good morning, my name is Sean Jude McCoach, and I'm the publisher of the Central Penn Business Journal and Central Penn Parent Magazine. Welcome to this installment of the Central Penn Business Journal's webinar series entitled, The Private Sector, Not Public Policy, Holds the Key to Better Healthcare. Today's conversation is brought to you by SCNH Capital. SCNH Capital, an affiliate of SCNH Group, is an investment banking and advisory firm providing merger and acquisition, M&A, employee stock ownership plan, ESOP, capital raising, and business valuation solutions to middle market and growth companies nationwide. SCNH Capital delivers investment banking and advisory services across numerous industries, including healthcare, technology, manufacturing, and government contracting to help owners achieve their exit planning goals and liquidity objectives. To learn more, visit www.schcapital.com. That's www.schcapital.com. In a moment, I will be turning the conversation over to this morning's presenter, Christopher Helmrath. But first, a bit of housekeeping. All attendees are in a listen-only mode. The questions function is available if anyone has any questions throughout the conversation. Most questions we will save for the end. Our speaker will take as many questions as time permits. If a question is asked and does not get answered, it will be addressed offline via email. A recording of today's webinar will be made available soon after the conclusion of today's session on our website at www.cpbj.com backslash events. That's www.cpbj.com backslash events. At this time, I am pleased to welcome today's presenter, Mr. Christopher Helmrath. Chris is the founder of SCNH Capital and currently leads all aspects of the practice. With more than 30 years of investment banking expertise, Chris specializes in assisting public and privately held companies with corporate divestitures and acquisitions, debt and equity financing, strate strategic and operational planning, business valuations, financial and transactional advisory. CSC and H Capital has built a, built a national reputation in healthcare investment banking, having represented hospitals, universities, physician practices, and public companies. Besides his current ex experience in investment banking with SC and H Capital and his past experience with several national accounting firms, Chris has served as a corporate strategy professor in two graduate schools of business, Loyola University, Maryland Sellinger School of Business, and the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School, where he served as the director of the Capstone Program for 10 years. Thank you very much, Chris, for sharing your expertise with our audience today. If you're ready, please take it away. Good morning, everybody. You should see on your screen a PowerPoint of the outline that I will be using for discussion. My goal today is to try to create some business cases for you to consider for where the private business market can really be making a difference in the healthcare industry and the markets that we deal in today. And I'm going to try to lead you to those, maybe without calling them out specifically, but hopefully you'll be able to see where they play as we go forward. So as we look at the learning objectives that I'm going to try to take you through today, there are going to be some of the data and trends that are going on in healthcare now what I believe you should be expecting in 2018 and beyond, and then again, what our practice would believe to be some of the critical success factors that businesses could be thinking about if they're wishing to participate in the healthcare markets going forward. And I find it important that some data be put on the table that some of you may know, some of you may not, but I think it will help to position the, uh, the comments that I'm going to make today and will help you to better understand maybe why I see some of these opportunities for the private business world. So I have a couple of facts for you to look at. First, America ranks 42nd in life expectancy amongst the lowest of all of the developed nations. Conversely, in 2015, we spent $9,451 per person on health care, the highest of all the developed nations in the world. And that should scream as something that is somewhat disjointed 
that the quality that we're putting out for the dollars that we're spending doesn't seem to be appropriate, appropriately aligned. So let's go to some of the key data and trends that I think need to be considered by business owners as they're thinking about participating in the healthcare markets of today. And one of the things that I like to think about is who really are the players that are participating in the industry and it's going to be important to understand where they've been and where they're going. Traditionally, we've had providers at the top of my diagram. And those are your doctors, your hospitals, your clinicians. You have payers, the people that are actually paying for the health care that's being delivered. In many cases, those are insurance companies, the federal government, and state and local governments. And then the patients, us. Moms, dads, grandparents, babies, all of us are patients that are being treated regardless of the fact if we have insurance today or not. And I want to bring out a concept that has been seen in multiples of industries over time, and I'm going to highlight what that's doing in healthcare. And that's the concept of boundary blurring. And boundary blurring can be defined as the fundamental boundaries that have been specified through relationships, interactions and possibilities that most businesses are rapidly using and you're seeing dissolving over time. So historically, when boundaries have moved, whether they be geographic, scientific, technological, institutional, or cultural, the results have been momentous. So let's go back to the diagram of the players that we have. And now let's think of how bl boundary blurring has affected those participants. Today, our providers are no longer just doctors and hospitals, but they're drugstore chains and non-medical doctors or doctors of osteopathic medicine. Our payers are no longer just insurance companies and the government, but hospital systems, managed care organizations, and in some cases, physician groups. However, the only thing that hasn't changed are those of us as patients. And you're going to see in the, the material that I'm going to present today, I believe that understanding the patient and how you interact with the patient is critical in how the business world can be dealing with the healthcare industry as we go forward. So it's, it's not uncommon that costs are seen as going high and even getting higher. You see it in the press every day. And the underlying need for change is well beyond debate. Healthcare, and I'm going to use that as principally spending on Medicare and Medicaid, the government, represents the largest component share of spending that we have in this market, which is 28% of the total spend. That is adding to the US deficit, which adds to the US national debt, which is now estimated to be just over $20 trillion with the fiscal 18 federal budget. More importantly though, US healthcare spending has rocketed $1 trillion between 1996 and 2016 adjusted for inflation. So our total healthcare spending in 2016 reached $3.4 trillion. It's an increase of 4.8% over 2015. And this is all according to data from CMS. The agency further estimates the total spending will reach almost $5.5 trillion by 2025 due to an aging population and rising prices for healthcare services. So it was interesting. Researchers from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation set out to analyze how healthcare spending had changed since the mid 1990s to understand this data. And to make sense of how the spending had changed, they looked at five influencing factors population size, population aging, disease prevalence or incidence, service utilization, and service pricing. And they collected and analyzed data on over 155 health conditions and various types of care. And the findings boiled down to just a few things. Our aging population, the rising rates of obesity, and the increasing pricing on healthcare services. For example, in pharmaceuticals alone, age-related diseases 
and obesity-related diseases such as diabetes escalated dramatically. Of particular note, I'll highlight that diabetes was the most increasingly cost-increasing disease associated with $64.4 billion annual increase in spending since 1996, largely due to obesity rates. But increased spending doesn't lead to better health care outcomes, and studies have shown this. Recently, the Harvard Business Review published an article by two scientists that showed that healthcare spending in the US has reached that 3.4 trillion, and it accounts for 17% of the US GDP. What's unique, though, is that this is almost twice as much as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's 35-member country's average of just 9%. And as I highlighted earlier, our health outcomes are not as good, as twice as good as our spending with those countries. In fact, many outcomes are worse. Healthcare spending also varies substantially within the US. There is no clear relationship with spending on the quality of care and health outcomes. And this evidence suggests that there's considerable waste in US healthcare spending. This same Harvard Business Review research concluded that at least 20% of spending could be reduced without any harming of patients. The study was interesting. It went to look at practice patterns and how they differed amongst doctors and whether higher spending doctors had better outcomes in finding ways to reduce health care costs and improve efficiency of care without harming patients. And here were a couple key points from that study. The scientists used a 20% random sample of nationally represented data on Medicare patients who were hospitalized between 2011 and 2014 with a general medical condition and were treated by a hospitalist physician. For those of you that may not know, a hospitalist is a general internist who specializes in the care of hospitalized patients and is employed by the hospital. They later, later studied also patients treated by general internists as well. And what this approach tried to do was to circumvent selection bias, namely that physicians who spend more have worse patient, patient outcomes simply because they treat sicker patients. It would seem to make sense, those patients who naturally would be more expensive to treat. For those of you that are in the field, you would know this also as a case mix index. Because the patients in the study were in effect randomly assigned to hospitalists with various spending patterns, the study was able to determine that some hospitalists have a tendency to order more procedures, tests, imaging, etc and therefore spend more than their peers. Statistically, I think it's significant. The total sample in this study consisted of over half a million patient hospitalizations treated by 20,000 different hospitalists in over 3,000 hospitals across the US. And here's what they found. Even when patients with similar conditions were treated, Hospitals vary dramatically in their health care spending. But even more important, folks, the doctors within those hospitals varied even more. The difference in health care spending between individual hospitalists practicing within the same hospital were larger than the differences observed when comparing individual hospitals. That seems to be backwards, but the study supports it. Within the same hospital, the highest spending doctors, those that were in the top quartile, spent 40% more than the lowest spending doctors, those in the bottom quartile, for similar patients. The higher spending physicians did not have lower patient mortality or readmission rates than the lower spending physicians. 
The scientists summarize that higher spending does not lead to better, better patient outcomes. The policies to improve the efficiency of healthcare should not only focus on hospitals, but as historically been the case, they should also take doctors and clinicians into account. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the AHRQ, has done research on the subject of high reliability, safety, and efficacy. High reliability organizations use systems thinking to evaluate and design for safety, but they are keenly aware that safety is an emergent rather than a static property. New threats to safety continuously emerge, and uncertainty is endemic, and no two accidents are exactly alike. Thus, high reliability organizations work to create an environment in which potential problems are anticipated, detected early, and virtually always responded to early enough to prevent catastrophic consequences. This mindset is supported by five characteristic ways of thinking. Preoccupation with failure, reluctance to simplify explanations for operations, successes and failures, sensitivity to operations, and deference to frontline expertise, commitment to resilience. It's important to recognize that standardization is necessary but not sufficient for achieving resilient and reliable healthcare systems. High reliability is an ongoing process or an organizational frame of mind, not a specific structure. Now that would seem to go against everything that Edward Deming has taught us for manufacturing, but it's something that in healthcare, this study at least highlights, can't be standardized. One of the other things that we're seeing is that the industry remains economically disjointed and not efficiently aligned. And I'm going to highlight that with two variables, economics and demographics. Economically, notwithstanding notable exceptions like Kaiser Permanente, payers and providers have not worked together to share the economic burden of patient care, a model we now know today as value-based care. Improving the efficiency by which quality care is delivered cannot be achieved unless and until insurance plans, charged historically primarily with managing costs, collaborate better with hospitals and physicians, which are primarily responsible for driving the increase in costs. Imagine how the data from the study I just quoted from Harvard would be impacted if the hospitals were operating at risk versus fee for service. Accountable care organizations and other risk-based models will become more prevalent in population-dense areas and will create synergy between the dollars spent on care and the quality of care. And I'll go into that in some more detail a little further in the talk. But now I want you to also think about demographics and the business opportunity that exists. By comparison, rural health care will lag behind and this creates a real opportunity for providers who can create solutions to handle this population set. Rural Americans are suffering unique health care challenges that urban residents do not face. Rural encompasses all populations not included in the designated urban definitions and according to the most recent census data, approximately 20 to 25 percent of the U.S. population lives in rural areas. Of note, 33 percent of this population lives in health professional shortage areas, and that's in quotes from the government, classified as medically underserved areas. Typical demographic trends of rural areas include lower median incomes, a higher proportion of seniors, higher acuity levels, and lower life expectancies. There are specific ailments that impact these communities at a higher rate than urban communities. For example, obesity, lung cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, you see those ads on TV, and heart disease. Compounding these issues is the rate at which rural healthcare facilities are shutting down. Some facts. Recent research indicates that we have approximately 2,000 rural hospitals across the U.S. 210 of them are rated as most vulnerable, which means they could close any day, and 463 are labeled as at risk, maybe a few years without change. One-third of all 
rural hospitals fall into one of those two categories. This is going to have one of two impacts. Either the access to care or employment is going to go down and it creates a real opportunity in the market. But probably one of the biggest pieces that I see as a data and a trend that we all need to be thinking about as business people is that the patient population remains disengaged. Quality, cost-effective patient care is impossible without the active participation of the patient, especially among those with chronic illness and the elderly. This appears to be self-evident. I get it. But a 2016 survey of U.S. healthcare executives, clinician leaders, and clinicians by the New England Journal of Medicine's Catalyst Insights Council found that 54% of the respondents said that less than 25% of their patients were highly engaged. That is dramatic. And let's think for a minute, for those of you that will be going shopping in the coming weeks, or that might have been in an airport here recently, have you ever sat for an hour and just people watched? And ask yourself, what do you witness? I unfortunately have been in too many airports recently, and what I see screams that we need to shift our efforts to keeping people healthier, and how do we generate more personal accountability regarding our own health? I read a recent quote, which for some of you may not sit well, but I believe is important. And the quote is this, as citizens, we have the responsibility to lead healthy lives and share the physical consequences of our decisions when we don't. Until we do so, healthcare costs will continue to escalate while our collective health declines further. Let me share some data that I think supports that conclusion. According to the American College of Cardiology, cardiovascular disease accounts for approximately 800,000 deaths in the US, one of every three. It is the number one killer. It's not cancer. Stroke accounts for 5% of all those. Coronary heart disease accounts for the majority of cardiovascular disease, and more than 90 million Americans carry the diagnosis of cardiovascular disease. And for those of you that saw in the press yesterday, the standards for what now is high blood pressure has changed, thus quantifying more of us as having high blood pressure. The annual cost of cardiovascular disease now approximates $1 trillion. As adults with stroke survive due to better health care, stroke has become the leading cause of long-term disability in the U.S. And while smoking rates have declined, tobacco use has increased, and that 33% of all adults in the U.S. do not meet current recommendations for physical activity. More than 70% of all Americans are overweight, and obesity rates have increased over the past decade from 13% to 38%. Previous to the news that was announced yesterday, 34% of all adults have high blood pressure. 31 million American adults have diabetes, either which has been diagnosed or remains undiagnosed. And the CDC, to add insult to injury, has said that the leading causes of preventable death are obesity related, and that the medical costs for people with obesity are $1,500 a year higher than those who are not. So a recent study by the Harvard School of Public Health demonstrated that 80% of coronary artery disease could be prevented by four basic lifestyle improvements. Don't smoke, or quit if you do, maintain a healthy weight, be active in exercise, eat a healthy diet. Note that Harvard's not suggesting anything radical, increases in cardiovascular drugs, inpatient programs, are unproven forms of medical treatment. They're simply indicating that these four improvements could reduce 50% of strokes, 80% of sudden cardiac death, and 72% of premature deaths related to heart disease. And the last key data and trend is the uncertainty that we're seeing around the Affordable Care Act. 
My comments here are not meant to be political in any way, but they're meant to be highlighting of what's happening. The current healthcare debate in Washington centers around who should pay. Some want universal coverage, Others prefer a system with private payers and continuing federal programs with constraints. In my opinion, the reality is that neither of these actions or plans will result in a sound, sustainable health care system focused on improving health. A sound program must have three essential pillars. Improving individual health status and incorporating personal accountability. Realizing efficiencies and effectiveness of clinical care and shifting away from fee-for-service. So what do I think we can expect going forward into 2018 and beyond? We're clearly going to continue to see a shift in the historical economic payment system. As I've said earlier, in many cases historically, and in some cases still today, hospital and, hospitals and clinicians can spend money provided by payers without consequence for outcomes. Now the ACA came out with readmission risk, so the hospitals are now being penalized where before they were not, but this system has been in existence for many years. And the payers, both government and private insurance, really bear the risk of a patient's expenses and providers provide the services with no real alignment of interest. And let's just do a simple economic study. If you take the risk, you want to pay less. If you provide the service, you want to be paid more. Who's caught in the middle? We are as patients. We are being asked to pay higher premiums for tougher care in some cases, and that this shift between who bears the risk and who gains the profit is going to need to change. It's evident that the risk-bearing entities are where the opportunities exist for profit, because that's where the money can be made. Here's a startling statistic, whether you knew it or not. Currently, 40% of all hospitals in the United States have negative operating income. That is defined as the revenue generated from the services you provided against the expenses where you offer it. Getting aside from grants, fundraising, etc., 40% of all hospitals operate in the red today. And this trend is reminiscent that we're going to see of the capitation-driven trend of decades ago when hospitals started purchasing physicians groups and there would then be incentive for parties to share the risk. I think we're going to see that coming much faster than we've even seen today. More hospitals and physicians are going to have to work together. The hospital value-based purchasing program instituted by CMS which compensates hospitals on the basis of achieving certain quality and resource targets may be more effective if individual physicians are targeted as well. A large step forward will be the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, which just went into effect here in 2017, which requires most physicians to be measured and reimbursed on the basis of the quality and cost of care that they provide. With this shift beginning, payers and providers are blending to create an aligned entity where the risk-bearing entity can also control the services provided and therefore theoretically manage the quality as well. Almost 70 million patients, or 25% of the population, falls under this system today, be it through ACOs or managed care groups. But I think it's too soon to conclude that provider-focused health care reforms can improve the efficiency of health care spending without compromising patients' health. Understanding the reasons behind the greater spend is going to be incredibly important. If some providers spend more to compensate for lower clinical skill or lower comfort with the uncertainty of clinical decision making, the incentivizing these physicians to utilize fewer resources could worsen patient outcomes. In contrast, if higher spending providers simply spend more because they don't directly face the cost of ordering those additional tests or, or procedures, it's possible they could spend less without affecting the patients. We need to experiment with provider-focused strategies for improving healthcare efficiency and efficacy, and this can surely come from the private sector developing tools to make this happen. It's reflective of the need to develop closed loops of care, building in the gaps between the healthy and the chronic, and really knowing your patient. And we're seeing this shift happen already, providing higher quality services at lower costs. 
Here in central Pennsylvania, we see it through the hub and spoke systems that are being developed. Through day-to-day -day collaboration, providers can enable patients to achieve positive health outcomes by helping them with access to outpatient and inpatient care with increased efficiency. We see that with urgent care versus emergency care, ambulatory surgical centers, and networks of primary care centers, ambulatory, being feeders for larger clinical settings to handle tertiary and quaternary care services. As an example, the Cleveland Clinic is already doing this with many of the regional hospitals by promoting their cardiology care programs which have been white labeled with regional medical systems. The same essential need exists with nursing homes and the myriad of rehab therapy providers where a disproportionate share of medical spending is occurring. By establishing coordinated care with the patient's primary care physician and the multiple secondary levels of care, it would seem that quality would increase and costs could be reduced. How can we use customized solutions through the use of medical data? Historically, healthcare providers have developed information systems for essential business functions, revenue cycle management, for example, but far less frequently to enhance patient care. But let's think about what could potentially develop in the future. Given the promising advancements in gene therapy, federal policy could be relaxed to allow for predictive analytics and patient modeling in ways that are currently prohibited. The longstanding reality about public policy is that the bigger the regulation, the greater the unanticipated consequences. HIPAA's prime objective of safeguarding us is great, but it's also created barriers. The ability to share a patient's healthcare information across all the disconnected providers who care would bring real efficiency and efficacy. How do we increase patient engagement through mobile health healthcare tools and solutions? An astonishing fact, digital health apps could save the US seven billion per year. That study was done by the IQVIA Institute and it was found by extrapolating the reported performance of consumer mobile apps for areas in diabetes prevention, diabetes care, asthma, cardiac rehab, and pulmonary rehabilitation. So that estimate was only based on those five areas, but the findings said if you extrapolated that to all diseases, the savings could reach $46 billion. Let's just use telehealth as a benchmark. It started four decades ago with long distance transmission of imaging. We sent x-rays for analysis. With risk models changing, we are now able to use expertise in a central location versus every location being tested, even using international and peer-to-peer -peer networks. An example exists in Northern Virginia with the health system INOVA. They're using virtual medical centers with intensivists, those internists that specialize in ICU care across the entire state of Virginia. One of the areas that I think we're going to continue to see is increased investment with private equity capital. There is currently $960 billion of unspent private equity capital that's been committed to be spent. We've seen it across many markets of healthcare, from outsourced services to physicians practices, lab services to nursing care. And since 2011, healthcare is ranked among the top three industries in terms of private equity returns. And in 2016 alone, $36.4 billion was invested, the highest since 2007. And think about that. That was even with the uncertainty of what was going to happen with the ACA. In terms of M&A activity, we're seeing that according to multiple analysts, it's not going to stop. It's only going to increase. At a macro level, we've seen it at the payer and related services, biopharma, med tech, and healthcare IT. But at the local level, we're seeing it with healthcare systems integrating physicians and networks, and these being developed to better suit the patient needs. Let's look at one recent M&A case study as one that I don't think many people saw coming, and that was the potential of CVS acquiring Aetna. This merger has the potential to deliver incredible benefits to the marketplace, namely the ability to drive down drug prices at a time when consumers are paying for an increasing share of that cost. 
In buying Aetna, CVS is seeking to really replicate the success of United Healthcare Group, which has built Optum, their health services arm, into multiple areas of healthcare expertise. With drug, with drug prices accounting for approximately 10% of the overall cost of healthcare, CVS can provide better management to Aetna's customers with pharmacy benefits by being in a position to negotiate better drug prices. Given that the average deductible for people with employer-provided health care coverage rose from $300 to $1,500 from 2006 to 2017, this could be very health care friendly. They have a strong consumer brand and provides a highly scalable model. Consider this, 80% of the entire U.S. population resides within five miles of one of CVS's 10,000 retail stores, and 50% of the entire U.S. population within 10 miles of their urgent care brand, Minute Clinic. Integrating disparate aspects of patient care can enable better clinical management, improve coordination of member care, and thus drive increased identification and closure in the gaps of patients' individualized care. Now, some people would say that the only reason they did this was because Amazon might enter the pharmacy benefit management space. And that could very well be true, but I'd like you to consider this. Of the patient data that CVS has and that Aetna has, how powerful could those data sets be coming together to improve healthcare in the future? And I'll address that here in a minute. So let's talk about some of the critical success factors for business and healthcare we believe going forward. We're going to have to emphasize technologies and solutions that are patient-centric. It's critical. It has to happen. Care integration is being practiced now by drug retailers and health systems. We're seeing it in places like Duke University that they piloted partnerships with Apple and Fitbit that is integrating into their clinical data system, Epic. Think about this. So many people wear devices, and we see them, and some of you may have them on today, to track information. Steps, for example. But without some integration into a process to decipher what that data means, it's just that, information. The explosive growth of telehealth is supported by multiple trends from aging population with comorbidities creating a burden on the cost of healthcare and mobile technology. A research study done by Cowan Equity Research believes that there is a $57 billion opportunity here alone. It's important to understand, though, the difference between telehealth and telemedicine. Telemedicine is the use of electronic information and communication technologies to provide and support health care when distance separates participants, and telehealth is more broadly defined through self-care, education, and support systems. As we talked about earlier, 20 to 25 percent of the U.S. population is rural. Some of the most dramatic changes in technology are happening today in breakthrough, breakthroughs in cell and molecular biology. We're seeing that when you hear of stem cells, immunotherapy, et cetera. Individualized precision or personalized medicine will provide a genomic blueprint to determine each person's unique disease susceptibility, define preventive measures, and enable targeted therapies to promote wellness. Disease management diabetes that I highlighted earlier will become critical as scientific advances enable better treatments for these chronic diseases. Think about this. HIV years ago, now today, allows people with HIV where heretofore may have thought that they were going to be morbid, can now live with that. Many scientists believe that that's where we're going to get with cancer as well. So many of the leading cancer treatment centers are using personalized cancer therapy as a way to deal with that. The advent of low-cost, reliable consumer genomics has given ordinary people an unprecedented measure of control over their health information. Now, this could also be seen as dangerous because they're not going to know what to do with it, but companies such as 23andMe, patients like me, and Curious are developing products and platforms to help hundreds of thousands of Americans manage and monitor their health. These companies are also making it easier for research to manage privacy concerns, researchers, store large amounts of data, 
and report new findings to the patient community as they happen. Consumer-facing companies have to have data sharing built into it, and this is where interesting and unique joint ventures could be formed. 23andMe partnered recently with the Michael J. Fox Foundation, the biotechnology firm Genentech, and the Parkinson's Institute and Clinical Center to come up with a new platform to help people better understand these risks. But I think it's going to be important that we understand the technology adoption curve. As is the case when a wave of any new innovation is introduced to a marketplace, the sellers of that technology need to be savvy in targeting both the early adopters and early majority, not just simply the innovators, so as to hasten the adoption of their products. While payers and providers are becoming less adverse in their decision making, many are still reluctant, at least initially, to depart from conventional wisdom. Healthcare moves at a slower pace. They need to recognize that patient-facing technologies will likely take longer to be embraced by the general population and not everyone will do so. So many people think today, you have a patient portal, you have email. I can tell you I work with my in-laws who are both 83 years old and that concept does not resonate. We're going to have to develop patient engagement platforms that can expand with the patient's needs. Healthcare providers must engage with patients doing, during routine exams and when problems arise, but in the changing healthcare landscape, that's not going to be enough. It now has to extend beyond the exam room, whether it be health information on regular and proactive interactions between the patient and physician. Interactions that encourage patients to actively manage their health as part of a broader goal to drive measurable improvements. Catalyzing participation of patients in their health and incentivizing well-being remains a stubborn challenge for providers, especially amongst the poor and elderly. This will require not only enhanced functionality, ranging from adherence to biometrics, but also synthesized patient data to better understand outcomes. I'm sorry, we have ambulances running by. For example, providers need to consider the fast approaching era of personalized medicine and the various data sets it's going to require. Since this data will often come from different sources, a primary care physician in one network, a specialist in another, it's not going to be as simple. A possible solution to use this could be blockchain technology. This concept everybody sees as what emerged in 2009 and people know today as being used by Bitcoin. But here are some things to know about blockchain and its potential use in healthcare. It's a record that can be shared amongst a network of computers and users on a network that can record transactions. Instead of a database that is centrally located, the database is distributed to the networks. Transactions are kept secure, kept secure via cryptography and transactions have to be approved and verified by the network in process. Since users' transactions are directly added to the ledger, it eliminates the need for middlemen that traditionally may facilitate those transactions. This technology could become prominent in healthcare as it offers a means to interoperate since all users of a network can access that network and all pieces of information are verified. The president and CEO of Humana believes that blockchain will become the next big healthcare technology innovation, particularly as it relates to payments and payer contracts. For example, in a situation when a health plan and patient are dealing with a contract, the blockchain can automatically verify and authorize information in that contractual process. No more back and forth haggling. Total transparency. Another potential healthcare application Healthcare application is population health. Instead of relying on health information exchanges to aggregate data, blockchain will leapfrog population health by providing trust where none exist for continuous access to patient records by directly linking information to clinical and financial outcomes. Here's an example. GEM, a company providing enterprise blockchain solutions, launched GEM Health a network for developing applications and shared infrastructure for healthcare. This technology allows participants to move data in real time without the need for reconciliation because each participant is connecting to the same network 
working on shared information and collaborating peer to peer. Because the integrity of the history can be proved with mathematics, the level of trust is high. And we also have to realize that the dynamic of what we knew to be deals in the past are changing. Transformative change in healthcare means that mergers and acquisitions as well as working partnerships and joint ventures will no longer adhere to conventional standards. The ability to ascertain the real objectives of a deal will determine the success becomes even greater. Given the large number of not-for-profit healthcare entities, simply saying that money is the be-all, end-all will no longer be true. Let's look at what's happening in central, Pen central Pennsylvania alone. Pinnacle Health is now officially joined to UPMC. And at that time, they announced in a separate deal that they were acquiring four additional hospitals. UPMC just recently announced, for those of you that didn't see, a bold plan to transform patient care with three leading edge new specialty hospitals that will offer next generation treatments in patient focused technology enhanced settings. Those are gonna be the UPMC Heart and Transplant Hospital, the Hillman Cancer Hospital, and the Vision and Rehab Hospital to go along with their others. But these digital hospitals will need to be seeking greater efficiency at lower cost to make all this work and to create the, the ability to connect devices and technologies. In the case of these three hospitals, it meant leveraging Microsoft's experience in AI and cloud computing to help them figure this out as opposed to them doing it themselves or acquiring somebody and trying to bring it in-house. These issues are going to include the siloed information systems, regulatory uncertainty, inadequate communication between physicians and patients, and physician burnout. Microsoft is hoping to bring this to UPMC to bring a better healthcare outcome for the people of central Pennsylvania. It's also important to think about that UPMC now has over 3 million members in its insurance division and is considered the largest medical insurer in Western Pennsylvania. While we could debate this for days, just stop and think what other potential opportunities might exist beyond what's already happened with UPMC. With many deals ultimately seeking their success by being a series of smaller deals that are going to culminate in final outcomes that are going to meet the market. I think so many business owners believe that they're going to be the next IPO or the next Facebook. But what they need to think about is this. What is my core competency and what does my business or solution bring? Is it a standalone solution or is it better if it is embedded in somebody else's solution? So does the data that you own really provide value? Back to my point of CVS and Aetna. A real patient potential benefit could be in data. With the world rapidly shifting to the benefits of artificial intelligence and predictive analytics, patient care data can lead to better disease and chronic care management. By integrating more patient data into analytical tools, we could very well produce breakthroughs and formularies of care and truly allow for increased service quality at lower costs. So as I wrap up what I've tried to present today, I have a few final takeaways for you. I really believe that the private sector has an opportunity to make a dramatic difference in the healthcare market and believe that I've highlighted several of those areas. But it's important to remember that the rate of change in healthcare is slower than in most industries. The United States has what is arguably the most complex healthcare system in the world. And as a result, changes from with the within the industry are going to remain slow. To understand what may come, it helps to have a deeper understanding of that healthcare complexity and don't just assume that you've got the next greatest thing that healthcare could need. I truly believe that embedded innovation leading to diversified and integrated solutions will really make a difference as we move forward. 
something that somebody else has when combined with what somebody else has could be that unique unlocking of making healthcare better for all of us. And at the end of the day, healthcare is really about two things. Better quality for those of us as patients and trying to reduce the cost in that delivery so that economically it makes better sense and we're in a better position going forward. So with that, that's my presentation and I'm willing to take any or all questions that you may have. Chris, thank you very much. Uh, so the first question in queue today uh, is what percentage of inpatient hospital beds are occupied by people who had they made different lifestyle choices, i.e. smoking, would not be in the hospital. Do you have any data on that? I can't, I, I don't have any specific data. I could try to look into that. I can tell you it is a large number. Just back to what uh, the American College of Cardiology and the CDC have highlighted, if we look at all of those diseases around obesity, diabetes being the greatest, it is a large number. And that is one of the biggest issues the population health specialists are trying to wrap their hands around. But I don't have an exact number, but I can try to find it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question here, um, it, it's kind of based on mobile health, I'd say. Improving disease management, member engagement, and date collection distribution. Are there any specific areas that do not seem to be covered today? Well, I don't know. Does it mean that there are technologies out there doing all of those? Yes. Have they been adopted? No. And I think it goes back to, has somebody really created the mousetrap that somebody's willing to try? And at the end of the day, until we can have adherence from a patient engagement side, if Mrs. McGillicuddy was in the hospital being treated by an intensivist for uh, pneumonia, and Mrs. McGillicuddy is given a prescription and told that she needs to see a respiratory therapist the day after she leaves. And Mrs. McGillicuddy doesn't stop at CVS to get her prescription and doesn't follow through to see the therapist. She's going to end up back in that ICU. And we haven't found a way as a system to close that loop. And I don't know if it's a mobile health app or what it is, but what you're starting to see a lot of leading hospital systems doing are creating care coordinators that immediately follow up with the patient when they leave the hospital or the care setting. And it's not a mobile play, but it's a person play because it's the most effective still today. I know that's 1950s. Soon we'll get to where it'll be mobile, but that goes back to my adoption curve discussion. I don't think we as a system have found a a solution yet, but it's something that we need to find collectively or this will not stop. Excellent. One just came in right now. Do you believe there will be changes in the legal risk placed on individual providers to that may lead to overprescription of procedures, medication, or specialty referrals? Interesting question that could be taken in a lot of ways. Regulatory effects can be anything, of course, as we know, and laws today, whether it be tort reform, could also aid in that. And you'd have to hope that at some level, as I tried to highlight, physician care is not a process that you can completely make linear today. And I fear that if somebody tries to do that, from what I've seen and the work that we've done, we could get scary outcomes. And that was part of back to the Harvard study where they said we can possibly get to some level of process, but to fully processize anything could be dangerous. And at some point, we're going to have to let the trained clinicians do their job. And I don't know where that slope sits from an efficacy standpoint, but I know that payers are dealing with it and as hospital systems are taking on that risk of becoming payers as well, the boardrooms of all of these major hospital systems are dealing with that as their number one issue. Excellent. Thank you for taking that. 
So I'm going to ask you to go into your crystal ball for this last one. Um, I think everyone on the line is interested in hearing your opinion. So repeal, replace, or substantial modification of current health care laws. What do you think is going to happen? I think a, a body at rest likes to stay at rest. and. If we look at DC right now, I don't think they could order our lunch appropriately and come to a conclusion. So I, I truly don't see much changing in the healthcare laws, but I see uh, continued work around the, the risk models that are going to happen, whether that happens from a regulatory standpoint or a business standpoint, I think is going to be critical. And I think that many of the tenants that ACA has created, I think are going to be very difficult to take out or completely evaporate from the system. But the point that I want to make, and it, again, non-political, none of what is being debated now addresses the, uh, the points that I highlighted, which are until we get a healthier patient population, we're not going to fix this problem. It's only going to be who's going to pay for it and who's going to take the responsibility of scheduling and how that gets done. And I think until we really address that and find a solution to that, we're really just playing ring around the rosy on what the biggest issue is in healthcare today. Great. Well, we're running right up against uh, the 12 o'clock p.m. hour. So at this time, I'd, I'd like to thank Chris and everyone at SCNH Capital for lending their expertise and insights into this very important topic. I hope that everyone online has enjoyed this time as much as I have and have two or three takeaways that you can possibly implement at your places of business. Thank you to everyone who asked questions. Again, if we did not get to your question this morning, Chris or someone from SCNH Capital will get back to you offline. This ends today's call. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day and a very happy Thanksgiving.